Welcome back, everyone. We are Simply Bitcoin. We break down the news from Twitter, the daily fail, meme review, software releases, hardware releases, and the websites by plebs. Joining us today, very special guest, Dr. Ron Paul, not the American politician, different Dr. Ron Paul. And he's quoted in The Economist, Forbes, Politico, Reuters, and elsewhere, including academic research papers and U.S. Senate testimony describing the modern anti-money laundering experiment. Yes, that sounds amazing. But first, we're going to the numbers. That's right. Number time. Number Time is brought to you by Bitcoin 2022. It's going to be the largest Bitcoin conference ever. Get your tickets fast before the price goes up in six days and take advantage of the link down below for 10% off your tickets to Bitcoin 2022. At the time of this recording, the block height is 712,144. The Bitcoin price, 57,140. Chain rewrite days, 842. Total public lightning capacity, 3,302.85. That's right. We are holding steady. Sats per dollar or Moscow time, 1750, and blocks to the halvening, 127,856. I have, a, I have a question for Dr. Ron, Phil. I have a question. Yeah. Because he told us that he's, he's just getting his feet wet in the Bitcoin space. Uh, Dr. Ron, when you see the Bitcoin price, you know, as an observer, right? Because Phil and I are, are in the flux, you know, so obviously, you know, we're very biased and we see it. But from an outsider's perspective, you're looking at the Bitcoin price today. What are your thoughts about it? What are your feelings? Do you think it's too expensive? Are you, you, you kind of, you know, awestruck? What are your what are your thoughts about it? Not, not at all, really. To, to me, it's, I mean, I've got an economics background as well, I suppose. So to me, it's just a number. So, you know, it used to be, you know, less than a dollar, you know, 10 cents or so, and, and, and it's been up to 64,000, maybe it'll be a million. It, it's kind of irrelevant what the number actually is. Um, it just is what it is. And and for me, it's, is it, a, is it useful? Um, uh, does it serve a purpose? Um, and, and the price is, is, in that sense, largely irrelevant. That is super refreshing because what we've usually noticed, uh, spe especially people, perhaps because you in your in your line of study, but I, we we kind of have a joke on Bitcoin Twitter, which is if you have a if you have a PhD in economics, you don't understand Bitcoin because it's really a PhD <laughs> in economic and Keynesian economics, right? Yeah, so, very cool. So and, I mean, in fact, my 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 my, my degree is, uh, in economics is is merely a bachelor's degree, and uh, it was it was a bachelor's degree back in the day when uh, uh, it, there wasn't even behavioral economics. And I wish there was, because to me, that's that, that's the most exciting area, really. Um, and so I, I went to uh, psychology lectures and um, instead, uh, as, uh, and the, the psychology lecturer said, well, I didn't see you at the exam. I said, well, I'm not enrolled in your class. I'm just here because it's fun. Um, so, so uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm with you on that. So your mind wasn't corrupted by the Keynesians? No, no. Well, I was I was also lucky because I was doing a law degree at the same time as a, as my economics degree. So I think if I was doing one or the other, I would have been corrupted by either of them, um, because they're both um, you know somewhat mad in some respects, um, both areas. Um, but doing both together meant that you know uh, my brain had to jump around quite a lot, and um, uh, that made it interesting. Awesome. So when you see what's going on right now, and in, in, in specifically in the U.S., because I want to focus the new segment on specific on the KYC amount, I think the numbers is perfect for this. If when you see the the situation with the money printing all around the world, I know you were telling us before we started recording specifically about, you know, uh, the central bankers in the United States. Wh what are your feelings about it? Because you have to understand, Phil and I see it from a Bitcoiners perspective, right? We see it through the eyes of Bitcoiners we don't see it through the eyes of anybody else. So as someone who's just dipping their toes in the space, what are your thoughts on the historical amount of money printing happening on a worldwide scale? Well, it's quite astonishing, really, um, and, and I think quite concerning. Um, there's, there's two narratives, well, there's quite a few, but there's two main narratives in a sense. A lot of people think that you know, Jerome Powell has saved the economy by this, but um, actually there's quite a few others that, um, that think that this is creating a massive bubble in a whole lot of areas, including, of course, um, Bitcoin, but in property and uh, certainly in the S&P 500, et cetera. 
um, and the amount of money printing is potentially going to be uh, massively destructive and uh, even catastrophic for the uh, for the US dollar, um, but but also the impact globally is huge. And that flows onto every asset class. So obviously Bitcoin is one of those asset classes, but everything else. And you know, I find that quite disturbing that there is you know, it, was, it was since 2007, 2008 when this really, really started, and it's never stopped. And since last year, it's gone into hyperdrive. And so the impact of that um, is, you know, we still don't know what that impact is going to be, but it's not looking pre pretty in terms of where it's going to potentially end up. Absolutely. Phil? Do, do you think, okay, so let me ask you this. Do you think that we we sound crazy when 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 we think that, and it's okay if you do uh, when 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 we think that essentially these types of events right that that have been occurring especially in the last you know in the last two years not not even just that right even the two thousand and eight mortgage crisis the, these manufactured bubbles and busts right mm -hmm. I, I mean are are we, are we crazy that that we think that um, that essentially they're manufactured just to hide the money printing that they can't stop doing anymore. <laughs> Well, and again, this is not my not my um, specialty area as such. But That's okay. looking at it, and I've got a, I've got a, a, an economics, a, a dusty old economics degree. Um, it's uh, more than but, I've got. <laughs> but, but, but I don't I don't call myself an economist, but uh, at all. So I, I look at it in a sort of from a generally broadly educated sort of a, um, a perspective. So you know, I'm not claiming to be right as such. But but um, I think there's a lot to be said for allowing the economy to 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 have a few ups and downs as it goes along, rather than trying to prevent um, uh, that happening. And, and by preventing it and preventing it and preventing it, actually it's making it much, 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 much worse. Um, the bubble we're in now, it's you know, it's been called the everything bubble. It, you know, when that bursts, and, and I say when because it always reverts to mean, um, and it's it's been wildly above it for a long time. One, and I, I can't predict when it's going to happen, um, but but it always reverts to mean. That's the only lesson um, that that we can look at from history. Um, it is just going to be horrible for so many people. Um, and so, you know, my, my uh, traditional approach to this is, you know, why not just allow the economy to tick along, ups and downs, ups and downs, etc., cetera, um, uh, and to, to iron out the, the worst of it, perhaps, but not try and try and um, the massive control that's um, uh, since 2008 and particularly since 2020 that, that that's happening. So that's, you know, different people have different views on that. That's just, you know, where I come at it from. And uh, you know, I'm deeply concerned about where it's going to go. Absolutely. You sound like an Austrian economist. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, you know what, doctor, it's, it's incredibly refreshing to hear your perspective because Phil and I are just like, are we in an echo chamber? Are we seeing this? Because we are. You know? <laughs> yeah, we are in an echo chamber, but it's it's incredibly refreshing to hear, you know, someone mm -hmm. from outside the industry essentially making the same connections that Phil and I have been making for a year because it's incredibly hard on us, doctor, because we are we, we cover mainstream media or legacy media, They're not really mainstream anymore, but legacy media because it's our job to do so. But if you were to just listen and take their reporting at face value, you would have had this inflation would have caught you completely off guard. And it can't be that two small YouTubers have been telling everyone inflation was coming since January and we were right. And all of the legacy media machine was completely wrong. So it makes you wonder. It's like, are these people so caught up in their Keynesian economics or are they straight up lying to people to cover exactly what it is they're doing? Yeah, you know, a number of different ways. The straight economist approach would say that inflation is actually, in, you know, the, the money supply increase. It's not the increase in prices, but that's a bit too technical, I suppose. Um, but but also a big part of that is that there's been a massive increase in money supply, but the velocity of money hadn't increased much. That's why inflation wasn't, uh, in, in the in the sense of prices going up, wasn't so much. But a whole lot of that um, that equation is changing. Plus, of course, the supply issues which people are talking about. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we'll end up in a hyper um, inflation situation or not. Some people are suggesting that don't know the answer to that. But certainly it's 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 pretty significant. Um, and the Fed is in a very, very difficult um, position at the moment of its own uh, creation, I believe. Um, you know, does it address inflation as it's saying it's going to do or does it not do so um, and, and continue what it's been doing? Um, 
uh, it's it's not a good result either way. Yeah, they they either crash the economy if if they taper off, or you know they keep printing money and that causes inflation. But I'm so glad that we're seeing eye to eye. You know, that's incredibly refreshing. We've kind of been underwater for six months. Like, Phil, are we doing this right? So it's incredibly, um, you know, refreshing to hear from someone of your statue. And man, oh, awesome. But anyways, Phil, it's time for The Daily Fail. The Daily Fail is brought to you by Amber App. Check them out. Amber.app. Bitcoin made easy. It's the easiest way to buy Bitcoin. Stack sats with Amber App. The link is down below. Okay, so so Nico made a good point. He said that yellow is a spokes muppet. No. I'm going to I'm going to agree. I'm going to agree. He's not a spokes person, but he's a, he's a spokes muppet. Malaka. What do you think? Amber. The smart way to stack sats. That's right. Cleaned up my browser. Still haven't updated it yet because I have 36 windows open. But tonight it gets updated, so no more red. No more red up there, and that's right. I got rid of I got rid of the meta crap. Okay. <laughs> so because that's not actually being used. Oh, that was brutal. Anyways, shout out to Fractal Encrypt. I, I know I apologize to our guest. He does not know what happened yesterday, but Fractal Encrypt, the amazing Bitcoiner that he is, totally called me out on a shitcoin program that I had installed on my computer a long time ago that was still sitting there. Anyways. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, let's dive into this, right? We're, we're going right into it. Crypto scammers make 9 million on fake YouTube streams. Guys, I see these all the time. Let's dive into it. We can riff on this for a bit. Crypto scammers during the month of October got around 9 million by defrauding their victims through fake giveaway scams on YouTube. Tenable revealed that scammers tend to use old, irrelevant, and unrelated YouTube interviews videos featuring popular individuals in the shitcoin industry like Elon Musk, Vitalik Buterin, Michael Saylor, who's not a shitcoiner, he's a Bitcoiner, okay? <laughs> but anyways, they always group crypto all together, and crypto doesn't exist. There's Bitcoin and shitcoins. Apologies. Anyways, and others while accompanying the videos with tweets detailing a fake giveaway event. It continued that the scammers usually have a dedicated section in the video comment section where they promise to double the number of crypto donations sent by the viewers to their desired crypto wallet address. Fraudsters got over 8 million from Bitcoin related scams while they got $413,000 from giveaway scams on the second largest uh, crypto asset by market cap, Ethereum. It also revealed that the scammers profited from the growing popularity of the meme coin, Shiba Inu, as they were also able to defraud people of around $240,000. Okay. So look, I don't know if you guys see these videos too often, okay? But usually it'll show an interview, right? Like, like they were explaining, it's, it's exactly what it is. I report at least anywhere from three to five videos like that a day, okay? And it's really sickening because, let's be honest, right? Um, didn't Pomp end up having an issue with YouTube? Didn't they take his channel down, if I'm not mistaken? Okay, well, so they, there, they... There's a lot of, man, uh, Keep It Simple Bitcoin, they, they took right. his channel Keep off It Simple completely. Bitcoin too, right? And he's just offering how-to stuff. So, uh, again, right, so we're seeing, we're, we're seeing actual channels with Signal, okay, getting taken down, but yet the crypto scammers, they, they roam free. I mean, this is daily stuff and it's really scary. So please just, you know, I, I know that most of the people listening to this are, you know, fellow plebs and they already know this, but just if you're a noob, no one is just going to give you free Bitcoin. Okay. Like no one is just like, you're not just going to send Bitcoin and they're going to give you double the amount of Bitcoin that that's not how math works. Okay? That's not how any of this works. Right. I wouldn't give you double the amount of Bitcoin because you sent me a certain amount. Like I, I wouldn't do that. Why? There's no incentive. Okay. So don't, don't live in fantasy land. I think, you know, it's unfortunate and they, they prey on noobs in the beginning, you know, people that are just getting into the industry and, and they see Michael Saylor and they see these established figureheads and they automatically think, oh, this must be legit. But that's how complex the scam is, right? They they get video, old videos, then they, they come up with the header to make you think that it's, you know, it's Pomp, it's Sailor, it's Vitalik, actually behind those videos, but in reality, it's scammers. But the part that I want to focus on, Phil, and you kind of riffed on this a little bit, is the fact that YouTube is focusing on shutting down actual channels that are not scams, right? Rather than going after the, the you know, I'm sure they shut those down eventually, but they go on for hours, Phil, right? Oh, we're, I mean, don't get me wrong, you're, you're talking like, 
four hour, ten hour, twelve hour streams, and it's constant. Yep, it, it's Absolutely. insane. So uh, let's move on to the yeah. next fail. Next fail. We can go to the big review. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next fail. This is this is some juicy stuff, guys. All right. I'm giving a shout out to ICO Sonot. Tagged me in this. Coin Chris, this makes me proud. What's he talking about? BBC News reported this. Token Estate blocks JRR token cryptocurrency. They were going to ruin Lord of the Rings? <laughs> they were going to ruin... Wait. Just wait. They were going to ruin Lord of the Rings with a shitcoin. Very <laughs> clever, okay? And, and I, I'm going to add a, a shitcoining um, token story of my own where I tried to shitcoin Lord of the Rings <laughs> once in my life. But not real shitcoin, but a shitcoin type of move, as you'll see. <laughs> Anyways... <laughs> okay, so that, that photo is in New Zealand. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah it's little, the Hobbit. Which town. one? The Hobbit, the Hobbit town. town. It's a little little town out of oh. Manamata. That's that was filmed in New Zealand. That's where I That's am right awesome. now. That's awesome. I'm just up the road from that town. Cool. <laughs> I, you know what? I'm a huge fan of Lord of the Rings in real life, uh, you know, and it's, I, I think it's an absolutely amazing story. It has, you know, all the, the great themes, right? The, you know, light and darkness and all the fantastic themes that tug at all of our heartstrings. And um, yeah, I, I, I love it. Um, okay, so here we go. Let's, let's dive into this, these shenanigans. Token estate blocks JR token cryptocurrency. Lawyers representing the estate. Hold on, let me start again. I feel like the window's not big enough. Okay. Three, two, one. Lawyers representing the estate said the product launched in August infringing the author's trademark. Website selling and promoting the cryptocurrency JRRtoken.com and the token of power featured rings, hobbit holes, and wizard like Gandalf. The US-based developer paid the estate's legal costs, which the lawyer said were significant. The estate filed a complaint with the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, one day after tokens for the cryptocurrency JRR went on sale, aiming to organize the people towards a common goal of making JRR token the one token that rules them all. Yeah, I know. This is, this is corny AF. All right. And the domain name, jrtoken.com, registered in February 2021, right? <laughs> so you could see they, were, they figured that out real quick, uh, was specifically designed to mislead people into believing it had a legitimate commercial connection with the author. The developer said, the fact that the disputed domain name brings to mind the complaints, trademarks is indicative of the parody evoked by the JRR token, not of any purported bad faith. Really? And JRR stood for, check this out, journey through risk to reward, a reference to a unique form of digital currency. So the JRR had nothing to do. So the fact that they had the wizards and the same look, that, that was all just different, right? The name was really this. Yeah, journey through risk to reward. Oh, okay. But the WIPO dismissed this saying, it's not clear to the panel that journey through risk to reward actually means and why the term journey is relevant to the purchase of tokens. The respondent does not specify why the disputed domain name is humorous, funny, or nail biting, and not just a domain name chosen due to its similarities with the token estate's trademarks to take commercial advantage of its evocation. And there was no doubt the developer, there was no doubt that the developer was aware of Token's works and had created a website to trade off of the fame of these works. All right. So look, that last piece, right? So J.R. Token's books have been around for a very long time. A very long time. Like when I was 12 years old and 11 years old, those books were already old. Okay. So just to, just to give you an idea, right? And... And my shitcoin story goes like this. So not realizing, right, that in grade six, my teacher would read this book every single year. I didn't know this. So I decided that I would write a book report on that, on that book. But you see, I didn't actually read the book. I read the, you know, the, the, the front, you know, like the, the front piece, right, with like the little intro. And then I read the back of the book. And then I wrote my report. And then I stood there in front of the class and I essentially read what I had plagiarized. 
And my teacher, who was very nice at the time, had pointed out that she reads this book to her class every year. So, <laughs> that's he, BS. What he, this guy, what this developer is saying that he had never heard of Token's work, like, don't, don't, don't bullshit a bullshitter, bud. Okay, you, <laughs> like, you, I, I got busted for you this. Dishon you dishonored the doc. Okay? I did. I totally did. Right? And, 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 like, I learned a very valuable lesson at a young age, right? Which is proof of work. Do the work. Okay. okay. That's Do a good the lesson. That's a good <laughs> lesson. So, I mean, dude, does it surprise me that shitcoiners took a great piece of literature and they tried to profit off it? Not at all. Doc, do you have any closing thoughts on, on this madness? <laughs> I don't think I can add anything go cool, really. <laughs> Man, awesome, awesome fails, Ooh. Phil. But anyways, it's time for the Daily Meme Reviews. The Daily Meme Review is sponsored by Citadel 21. It's the best Bitcoin cultural zine, different artwork, every volume, and it's scarce. There's only a thousand copies per volume. Really cool stuff. Get your copy of Citadel 21 today. All right, everybody. The first meme for, for today is brought to us by Elon Musk, and this is the new CEO of Twitter, and this is a famous picture of Stalin, and he just, you know, they didn't even have Photoshop back then, but he Photoshopped the person out. <laughs> And uh, it's the new CEO of Twitter, and he photoshopped Jack Dorsey. And these are the original. Let me see if I could find the original pictures to kind of give you guys some reference. Uh, this is the original picture of Stalin and him just taking it out. And he actually executed. Oh, himself was executed. So he executed it. And I think it's a really reminiscent of the times. Anyways, next meme. Uh, it's not really a meme, but it's a very powerful image. And I picked this one because the doc was coming today. In 1964, the minimum wage was 5 was five ninety percent silver quarters in 2021 five ninety percent silver quarters have a melt value of twenty three dollars and thirty four cents we don't need minimum wages we need sound money i think that's insane right that the actual voluntary um the voluntary the the monetary value of the money remains but as it debased it just the the money the money became worthless absolutely fascinating last but not least this is meme by DJ B Foot Bridges. Natural progression has permitted the shells, the gold, you know, the, the the beginning of paper money, and where we are today. Proof of work, and it's Bitcoin. So awesome memes, really really cool stuff. Phil, for that, I'm going to give it one half eaten plantain chip. What about you? That Phil's is an coughing. awesome score. Yeah, excuse me. That is an awesome score. I am going to get, so love the memes. I thought they were great. And I totally love that, that meme with the money. Fantastic. Uh, really well illustrated. Sells a whole history of money all in one picture. Memes, very important. And on that note, I am going to give it this travel mic. That's right. It's for an iPhone. Does it work? Yes. It's a very good mic. It's awesome. That's really cool. What about yeah, you, it's a sh it's a Dr. Short. Paul? What would you give those memes? It's a good book. It's a good book. It's a classic. <laughs> so I feel like you've read it. You looked at it as if you read it. I, I yeah, have. The blunders, the blunders of government? No, I'm shaking my head because I'm like added to my wish list. <laughs> yeah, like that, that sounds well, like something I, everybody should be reading. <laughs> well, I, I think every new, uh, every new parliamentarian should read that. That's, based, that's actually a UK-based book, but any country could um, produce a, a similar book that, uh, that looks at... Um, you know, a whole lot of things that governments have done that were plainly flawed um, years later, massive cost, massive expense, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and they just, it just, it just goes on. It carries on. We've got, uh, you know, a few dozen in the last year, just in the U S another few dozen in the UK. So you could write a book like that every year, sadly. What, what's the really famous saying where it's like, you mess up in government, you get promoted, you mess up in private business, you go out of business. You know, it's, yeah. it's the only, the only, you know, I would say institution, corporation, whatever. I don't know what you want to describe it as that rewards failure, right? So yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a really good point. But anyways, Phil, it's time for the daily news. The daily news is brought to you by CryptoCloaks.com. Get yourself the best 3D printed Bitcoin merch, like the 3D printed Bitcoin grenade art. Really cool stuff. You can unravel it and you can put an open dime in there or the 3d printed bitcoin honey badge you could also put your favorite hardware wallet really cool stuff take advantage of the link down below for five percent off cryptocloaks.com all right everybody so check out this article sec chairman gary gensler bitcoin competes with the u.s banking system and we brought a very special guest to talk about the the aml the kyc all of that stuff but anyways i'm going to tie it in a second 
Bitcoin is a competitor to the U.S. banking system and its worldwide consensus, the Security Exchange Commissioner Chairman Gary Gensler said on Wednesday. We layered our digital money system about 40 years ago with money laundering and various sanctions and regimes around the world. We layered that over a digital currency system called our banking system, Gensler said. In 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto wrote, in, uh, wrote this paper in part as a reaction, an off-the-grid type of approach. It's not surprising that there's some competition that you and I don't support, but that's trying to undermine the worldwide consensus. Now, I want to focus on this part where he said 40 years ago with money laundering and various san uh, san uh, sanctions, right? So uh, the reason I wanted to focus on that is because we brought Dr. Paul today to kind of debunk a lot of the official narrative that you know these regulators would like you to believe because essentially the way that he's posing this is the world would bu would burn down without the current money laundering system but we covered this many many months ago the actual current money laundering system is extremely inefficient and it doesn't do what it's supposed to do and uh this is a perfect segue to Dr. Paul's paper, Anti-Money Laundering, the World's Least Effective Policy Experiment, Together We Could Fix It. So anyways, the introduction says, a worldwide policy paradigm enforcing complex anti-money laundering laws gives the comfort of activity and feeling of security. And this is exactly what he's referring to when Dr. Gensler, sorry, not Dr. What am I saying? Chairman Gary Gensler uh, says this, right? You know, he's acting as if, you know, the current monetary system is good if you compare bitcoin bitcoin is all inclusive bitcoin doesn't care where you're from what your skin color is what country you happen to be born in it's all inclusive anybody could download a bitcoin wallet the the current monetary system if you happen to be born in afghanistan if you happen to be born in venezuela you are deemed unbankable by the system so one is a system of inclusion, the other is a system of exclusion. But anyways, continuing on. Letting criminal enterprises retain up to 99.95% .95 of criminal proceeds, the modern anti-money laundering experiment unwittingly enables, protects, and supports terrorists, drug, human, arms, and wildlife traffickers, sex, and law labor exploiters and corrupt officials fraudsters and tax evaders on a global scale so it actually does the exact opposite of what it's supposed to do anti-money laundering is a globally significant policy function affecting millions of businesses and billions and billions of people daily so it seems odd that policy design issues are mostly addressed independently more explicit connections with the rigor of policy science should contribute to better results right and uh, here is no success metric, minimal data. Despite trillions of dollars poured into the global 30-year war against money laundering, the anti-money laundering movement remains unable to show policy success. The primary goal was to use money flows to detect and prevent serious crime and thereby reduce and prevent the economic and social harm caused by serious profit motive motivated crime it is against such outcomes that effectiveness might be best judged curiously no such crime reduction and prevention measures were identified so dr ron i think we have been pitched as a society what i was saying earlier that without these measures in place the world's burned down i think when they made bitcoin legal tender in el, el salvador it actually showed the exact opposite of that bitcoin actually included more people right into the monetary system in a month of being legal tender than the legacy financial system did in 40 years and the specific numbers is there's 1.8 million bank accounts in el salvador there is currently 3.3 million people that have downloaded a Bitcoin wallet in El Salvador. So already more people are using Bitcoin in only 30 days of Bitcoin being legal tender. So Dr. Ron, and I, again, this is a speculation. Why are these policies the way they are? If they were supposed to stop um, you know, money laundering, if they're supposed to stop crime and they're not effective at stopping crime, why do they exist? Well, I, I can't um, uh, talk to the reason why why they were put in that space, why they continue um, ignoring the, the the evidence. But certainly, when it was set up, it was never set up uh, to prevent crime. It was um, it was it was sort of a magical belief that if 
um, we comply with these rules that match these um, standards that should have an impact on crime. Now, from a scientific perspective, that's um, it's perfectly legitimate to make that uh, call back in 1990 as they did. Uh, to it's it's a testable hypothesis. So, um, okay, we've created these brand new standards, and we believe they're going to have this impact. Um, that's that's perfectly fine to to base something on an assumption. Don't have any problem with that in science. That's the way science works. Um, but the f curious thing about it is that come 1991, all of a sudden, uh, banks and so very few countries had signed up to that um, uh, to that new model because it didn't they couldn't demonstrate that it had an impact on crime, and so FATF, the the um, Paris based outfit that's responsible for these standards, uh, could ha had a choice essentially. It could have proved that it had an impact on crime, but of course it couldn't do that because it's, it, it hasn't had that impact even today. Um, but instead, banks started using it as a proxy, use the ratings as a proxy um, indicator of risk. Um, whether it was a real indicator of risk or not is irrelevant. And all of a sudden, um, for countries to get access to the financial system, they actually had to have the FATF tick. So countries signed up, not because it had an impact on crime or not, um, uh, not because the, the system actually worked or didn't work, but because they had no choice because the country needed to, you know, countries needed to have access to the financial system. And so from that moment, uh, FATF never had to prove that it had an impact on crime. And so, and they haven't. Um, and in fact, when you, when you, if you were to ask someone and you know, say, so where's the proof that it has an impact on a substantial demonstrable, and I'm talking about a robust, scientifically um, a robust um, demonstration, an impact on money laundering, impact on uh, serious profit motivated crime, an impact on terrorism, they have never proven it. They don't even collect the data on those matters. So, and let's talk about uh, what you're talking about. So you're talking about the Financial Action Task Force. This is a bureaucratic, unelected body based in Paris. So if if they're not effective on crime, and let me pull up some statistics. So, you know, the, I mean, sorry, some stats so that the audience could, could see from your paper. So in, in terms of the impact on pro profit motivated crime revealed by such studies, Europol says that authorities only confiscated about $1.2 billion of illicit funds annually. This suggests that the proportion of criminal funds recovered from the success rate of anti money laundering efforts by the UN is just 1.1%. ,1 right? So that's minuscule. And that's exactly what you're saying, uh, doctor. So who is the FATFA? What is their history? Why did they come about? Who they help more? Because if they didn't help anybody, they wouldn't exist, right? They were set up in, in 1989. G7 nations decided that they wanted to really attack, use the money flows, which it makes perfect sense. And there's actually legitimate science behind it as well. There's follow the money. Um, it goes right back into Italy and and, and partly in the US, etc. So, so there is science behind that. They follow the money. Um, so the G7 wanted to stop um, uh, drugs trafficking at the time. That was the main the main focus. So they decided to set up this new task force to do uh, to do that. Uh, unfortunately, the new task force um, did a whole lot of things and based a whole lot of what they were doing on a whole series of assumptions. And they came up with this idea, um, which is again not necessarily a bad idea. It's proven to be a bad idea, but um, uh, it was reasonable at the time. If we come up with all these standards. And if countries uh, comply with these standards, and if um, uh, countries put in place regulations that comply with the standards, and if banks comply with those regulations, therefore that should have an impact on crime, was the assumption. Um, that's never been tested. In fact, when scientists uh, have started to test that, and that started to happen about 1994, um, uh, scientists were able to find that it actually um, uh, doesn't, it isn't proven to have such an impact. Um, but it continues. Um, uh, for a whole series of reasons, um, but there's certainly a deep belief. Um, in fact, the AML system is a bit like you know how some people from the outside might look at Bitcoin as perhaps there's a there's a deep, deep, deep sense of belief um, in here, and certainly the AML community is is very, very strong. Um, on believing that it works. And when scientists point out, um, uh, you know, fairly uncomfortable truths and suggest, well, actually, you know, let's peel back some of these assumptions. Um, a lot of people really, they seem to take personal offense at it. And they, rather than testing the hypothesis themselves, rather than, uh, you know, engage in that conversation, they just insist that it must be wrong. Um, and that's been going on now for, um, you know, the better part of 30 years. So there's like cognitive dissonance when you actually show these individuals that the hard data, you know, 
the 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 what the actual results of their policies are they don't understand it could it be that their jobs depend on them not understanding it and that's why they are they react the way they do I think the reasons are complex. I think uh, you know people are complex beings, um, and there are a lot of people within the industry who, who have come to realise it, um, and are asking the questions. So, so that's actually really positive. There are a great many others who aren't. Um, there are some, as you say, whose job does depend on it. There are a great many others who have been um, the, the way that the system is set up. Um, the the expertise, the way it's set up, it's a it's a system that inculcates a narrative um, and it doesn't test the narrative and so the whole system is designed to um, to, to be self-perpetuating um, and that that is the way mm. um, it, it works and so you've got tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of compliance professionals most of whom are incredibly genuine and they genuinely believe they're having the impact on crime and indeed they, they, there are specific instances where they are having an impact on some criminal uh, activity so that reinforces that way of thinking and very often it's the it's that genuineness of feeling that is actually getting in the way because they so genuinely believe they're having the impact and then you if you test it they take that as a personal front rather than let's engage in that conversation and let's see if we can have a greater greater impact um, and, and often people also say oh but we're having some impact therefore that's a good thing and then they miss they miss the counterfactual so if, if our impact on profit motivated crime let's say the impact on um, financial um criminal finances is say 0.5% or 1.1%, whatever it happens to be, depending what um, uh, data you look at. Um, and they say, oh, well, that's a start. That's a good thing. We just need to do a bit more of it. Well, if we do that and we go from 0.05% to 0.1% to 0.2%, um, uh, but we're missing the fact if we look at it slightly differently, maybe we can go to 20% and have a massive impact on crime. Um, and it's not even th those percentages themselves are, are, are rather pointless. I use those figures, and the United Nations has used those figures. They're not actually outcomes either. Um, in terms of outcome science, what we're really looking for is, you know, what, how do we... Re dramatically reduce the social and economic harms from serious crime. And that's more difficult to uh, quantify and to measure. Mm. But we come back and we find the nearest proxy uh, to that. And one of those proxies is, is what the UN, as you've talked about, the, the, the so-called UN um, success rate. And that's a, a reasonable proxy. But what's really interesting is that what the industry itself does isn't even close to those proxies. The industry's measures, and they call it effectiveness and outcomes, which bears no relationship to effectiveness and outcome science, unfortunately, is all about activity and, um, and and outputs. So what it does, it measures what the industry does, not what it achieves. And that's a fundamental failing of the whole system. And it, it's been that way since, um, since the year dot, or it, 1990. It, it almost sounds like they're tailoring the data to kind of fulfill their own needs. And I, I was reading your paper as well, and lower in the paper it, it actually gets even more fascinating and this kind of bridges what a lot of bitcoiners had to say have to say about it you know maybe it comes from the conspiracy theory front but i'd love to get your opinion is that a lot of these systems are in place the way that we see it it's more so to control people than to stop crime and this is a fascinating passage from your article it says banks are a much easier target for regulators than criminals if authorities recover around three billion per annum from criminals uh, while it's imposing compliance costs of 300 billion and penalizing businesses another 8 billion a year it is reasonable to ask if the real target of anti money laundering laws is legitimate enterprises rather than criminal enterprises so it, it is and, you know, I, I saw that and I, I remember and we were reading this with Phil and I was shocked. I was like, isn't this the exact opposite of what it's supposed to do? It's supposed to stop criminal activity, but they're actually connect uh, collecting the most money from legitimate businesses. Isn't it the exact opposite? This sounds like a self. This sounds like a self-fulfilling uh, bureaucracy, Dr. Paul. Oh, it is. Um, uh, and I, in my research, you know, I look at it as scientifically as possible, as robustly as possible. So I don't attribute any, um, you know, what people are thinking or what they're trying to do, etc. to it. I look at the hard evidence and see what we what we can find from that. Um, every now and then we do get an, an interesting little snippet. So some scientists, for example, um, found that in, they, they found some declassified documents, um, correspondence between um, US and UK um, uh, officials in 1987, a few years before these laws came into play. 
and they only got a six month window of declassified documents they're, they've been declassified for a whole they've been classified for a long time and they only got that but that indicated that us and uk officials were deliberately seeking to undermine to enable laundering to continue which was fascinating when you when you come to it but my research doesn't doesn't depend on you know are they tr are they doing it for control reasons um etc because I look at the data and, and can't really attribute that, that sort of thinking to it. Um, but certainly it is consistent with that. Um, and very often one of the barriers is that because people believe that it has an impact um, and, the, and they genuinely believe they're fighting crime, um, so that's another possibility. Um, therefore, when you come up with um, uh, evidence that that's not the case, they don't engage in that conversation. As you said earlier, there could be cognitive bias um, uh, taking place there as well. So again, there's no need, in my, from, from my research at least, to attribute um, any rationale to it. It's just, I look at the impact and the effect. And so uh, the impact of these laws is far, far greater on legitimate businesses. And, and in fact, every every cent of that cost imposed on legitimate businesses all the penalties against banks that we all like to cheer because everyone hates banks um i'm, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing it just you know that's that's the public uh, has, has uh, that tends to happen well actually citizens pay every cent of that as taxpayers as um, shareholders and, and as citizens because you know banks pass on every cent of that um just in terms of the way the business model works so we actually pay the massive cost of it and there's only two industries that, two global industries that, that dramatically benefit from the current AMR laws, and that's organised crime and organised compliance. Wow. Um, so, Phil, do you do you do you have any questions? You know, I, I don't. I don't know if it's a question or more of an observation. I kind of want to get your take on this, but in just li in just listening to this, right, and, and listening to the, the the process that, you know, we make corporations go through. Essentially, this looks to me like they want to create a large enough moat so that there's no competition and the only people that can come into the game are people that are you know already into the, you know in the club or friends of friends in the club well that's that, that's actually very i mean again i don't say that's the reason people are doing it but that's mm. certainly the impact of it so um uh, absolutely there, there's a massive um uh, entry uh, market entry barrier here because the cost of this is so enormous um the economist pointed out a couple of years ago that major banks have up to 15 percent of their staff on compliance tasks now that's astonishing um uh, if it's anywhere near that in, in any large bank. But, but even if the, the fascinating thing is, even if you went to 100% compliance, you still couldn't comply because the laws are actually designed, they're impossible to comply with. Um, uh, I could go into any bank anywhere in the world with a, a couple of decent analysts and I will find breaches of anti-money laundering laws, no question. That's just the way it operates. Um, the, tr the, 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 so you could you could always find um, uh, compliance breaches, but but a great many of these breaches have nothing to do with. There's no money laundering uh, uh, involved. There's no uh, crime involved. They just happen to not tick the boxes that that they're told to tick. Do those do does ticking those boxes have an impact on money laundering? Does it have an impact on crime? Does it have an impact on terrorism? Well, we don't ask that question, um, and so we're penalising these banks for all of these things and that massive massive cost on those banks. The big banks can can wear it. Some have gone bust. But, but some of them, most of them, can wear it, and then you've got a a new and a, you know a new um, a startup that wants to come into the business, and they've got to put this massive cost structure in place, um, and it's really hard. So yes, it it chills competition enormously. You're making me think of the um, you know as you're explaining that I, I I'm to I'm totally going to butcher this, but it's it's like the broken window. It's like, it's like the broken window theory, right? Mm -hmm. Where, where it's like they and the other thing is the the other the other point too that it also makes me think of is is that it makes me think of the the story of the you know the bed of procrustes right where Nico we've discussed this before right where essentially the, the KYC AML they're they're essentially you know trying to um, you know kind of Frankenstein this system onto Bitcoin. I, I don't mean to, mm. but just to bring it over to Bitcoin, like they're trying to Frankenstein it onto Bitcoin. And that's, it's already not working effectively as, you know, as is actually proved in the current system. And I think it's, it's even less effective to, you know, essentially to Bitcoin. 
So, well, there's simplistic narratives. It's sort of the, the simplistic narrative that AML and anti money laundering stops crime and, and must be applied uncritically to um, Bitcoin and, and, and uh, other crypto, etc. Um, but but that's not actually the case. And so it's fascinating too. So when when Bitcoiners engage in the conversation about what regulation should look like, um, they're, they're fighting the the you know crypto is bad and it allows criminals to do their things. Um, uh, and so they, they they address those issues, and that's fair enough. That does need to be addressed and you're explaining to senators how it actually works etc and some have come on board and some are against it and you have that conversation but the real trojan horse seems to me is the bit that most bitcoiners aren't aware of at all because they take on board the narrative that um, aml is designed to stop crime and we all want to stop crime so okay we can accept that as a possibility let's do that the trouble is the aml system even in fiat does not have the impact that it has claimed. Um, and so that's the, you, know, you can you can explain why crypto is okay and everyone, um, it's, it's not used that much by criminals anymore. And in fact, fiat's used a lot more by criminals. You can explain all of that sort of stuff to senators. You can get them on board, but even so, once the AML thing is on board, um, on on in the crypto space, um, it's it's uh, you know it's not necessarily going to be particularly effective if it's um, screamingly ineffective in the fiat space and has been since day one. Um, for we're now over three decades of profound ineffectiveness. So, Doctor, you said earlier that it helps organized crime. Could you elaborate a little bit? Like, how does how does the current system, the current AML KYC system? help organize crime because you would think it would have the exact opposite effect no absolutely um, a couple of different ways of looking at it one big big picture um so uh, certainly um aml and and kyc does actually have an impact on crime it does stop some criminals right um so and, and that's why some people say oh therefore it works but you're kind of missing the point so let's say that um it's a we're having a 0.1% impact on criminal finances, which is a proxy towards the towards uh, uh, towards the impact. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether it's 0.1%, 0.2%, which is what the um, UN said a while ago, or, or, or the latest one, which is my 1.05%. It's de minimis, right? So um, doing more and more and more of what we what we um, doing more and more compliance, more and more regulations, which is the the, the standard response. So we get to 0.2%, we get to 0.4%, whatever. We're still having almost zero impact on crime. Um, and so crims are getting, you know, they, they get to keep 99.95% um, uh, of um, proceeds, you know, minus their costs, etc. cetera. Um, now, that's why it works really, really well. While we are focused on this, on, on sweating that 0.1%, rather than thinking hmm it's not working quite so well let's rather than focus on sweating that i mean yes that's good we, we're getting a few criminals let's stand back a bit and how can we actually reframe it and refocus it so we're actually hitting 20 percent, 30 percent, whatever it is when we're at that level um, which is a profound impact and my modeling shows that it's a massive reduction in cost massive reduction in compliance massive reduction in regulations to get a massive increase in impact on crime but when we're at that level that's when we're actually starting to have an impact on crime so when a crim uh, uh, is thinking do i set up my next sex trafficking ring which has been so successful so far um oh there's going to be a huge um, uh, likelihood i'm going to get caught mm, maybe i won't do that one you know that's a little simple plastic obviously but so so at that broader perspective it helps um crime because helps criminals because we are we are so focused on sweating that 0.1 percent they just carry on with their business thank you very much at a specific level um, and this is another thing too a lot of people in the industry think that you know kyc identification etc that's that's the nirvana and so a lot of businesses are set up okay i'm going to i'm going to check your id once i've checked your id tick i'm i'm helping stop crime but but people like me think well uh, it's empirical research so what's what's the reality what actually happens so uh, you know me and various other researchers have looked at what criminals actually do um, and i have found so for example in the housing industry i have found that um, in, in real estate transactions very often criminals loved when they were asked for id because in the past um, they were, you know, skulking in the background. Um, they had all this cash, they, you know, from their drugs dealing, etc. And and you know, it was quite difficult. Now um, they look like a property developer. 
you know, they've got, they've, they've, you know, actually KYC often helps. And I've got one of my blog posts um, points out some of this as well. KYC often helps um, criminals launder proceeds of crime um, uh, and make them look legitimate. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so at the at the big picture level um, and the smaller picture level, you know, I, I suggested in one of my articles, um, not an academic research paper, but a, a slightly um, a slightly more mainstream one, um, that you know, if we were to ask a criminal mastermind to rewrite the AML laws, um, she would say, "No, you're doing fine. Keep keep going the way you're doing it. That's good." That that's absolutely fascinating, and it and it, it actually. It, it makes sense when you think about it because criminals think it's like if I'm compliant, they'll leave me alone. So I just fi- I just have to figure out how to be compliant, and I'm in the clear. My money's in the clear. So well, talking- not, I, I can add, I can add a little bit more to that. Um, I was talking to a senior banker in the U.S. a little while back, and he was saying to me um, that actually. As long as criminals keep doing what they're doing, we'll never spot them. And the reason for that is because we've set up our systems the way that they all set up systems. We need to follow this. It's, a, it's rules and scenarios that they fo- focus on. These are rules. These are things we know criminals do. Therefore, you um, banks must must have these rules and scenarios to look for the criminals and along these particular lines. Right. And so um, they look for anomalies. Um, outside outside those things. And if, so if a criminal does something different, they might get spotted. So, so this chap was saying, as long as criminals keep doing what they've always been doing, we'll never see them. And this is a major, major US bank. Um, and you know, I, I've seen that in real life too. And it's also fascinating, the lawmaking process, and I pointed that in another blog post. Um, uh, this is, uh, AML has distorted the way laws are created. Ordinarily, you look at um, what's the problem? How do we fix it? Um, let's craft a law that does that. Um, and and yeah, you know, it's pretty rough um, sausage making process, the law making process. But that's broadly what it what it is. AML is different. AML is uh, we have to put in place these standard these laws that match these standards. So countries put in place laws that match those standards on the assumption it's going to have that impact. So again, I did some empirical research which identified exactly how um, uh, criminals launder proceeds of crime in a particular jurisdiction. Um, that country introduced laws, you know, AML laws. They were utterly uninterested in the research that demonstrated how criminals actually did it. And and certainly the uh, applying the FATF standards would have some impact in, some, in terms of some of that criminal activity that I identified. There's a great much, there's a lot of that criminal activity that the, the laws had, would have no impact at all on. Um, and so the only people who knew that was me, who, you know, having done the empirical research, and the crims. Um, uh, uh, the, the, whereas the, um, the lawmakers believed that it would have the impact. And even when they knew that empirical evidence existed, how um, crims actually launder proceeds of crime, they were uninterested because, no, no, this will fix it. Um, and so crims just carry on. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, man, this is absolutely mind-blowing, Phil. I just wanted to quickly say this is so interesting because it sounds just like what happens in the corporate world, right? You end up managing to the metric. So Mm -hmm. the criminals simply just say, oh, okay, this is this is the list I need to check in order to manage to this metric so I can move to the next step. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's even worse than that. (laughs) It's even it's even worse than that um, in a number of ways, because. The, the, the system is set up so that banks will do these things that we know that, that crims do, right? Now, that, that's maybe 1% of what actually crims do, right? So the 99 crims are fine, 99% of crims are fine anyway, right? Irrespective of that, because the system isn't set up to find crime. The system is set up to tick these particular boxes. Then on that, and I'm just making this figure up in terms of the 1%, the empirical research shows it's broadly somewhere there, but whatever. Um, so on that, on that 1%, Crims um, have to have to tick those boxes, as you say. But of course, all those boxes are, are, are well known in public, so the crims can study that in advance before they even become law, um, and so ensure that they, you know, tick those boxes nicely. Often, or sometimes, um, I can't say often because I don't know the the um, you know how how often it is. Um, but certainly, in my research, we find that crims actively go out of their way to tick some of those boxes that 
that that expose them in a sense because that enables them to do the laundering they're wanting to do and and allows them to in, in the case i mentioned to be seen as property developers rather than drug dealers which is apparently you know better in society um so that the, the it, it's quite remarkable when you look at it in an empirical basis but but the policymakers don't look at it from an empirical basis they look at it from the the, the, and the, it's also quite funny because they look at um, researchers and say, oh, you're, you're, you're dealing with theory. We deal with practice. Well, in this case, it's the exact opposite um, because the, they're dealing with a theory that, that the assumption that if everyone follows these rules, following these standards and everyone complies, therefore it should have an impact. That's a, by definition, that's a, that's an assumption, right? Um, and so, whereas researchers look at empirical evidence, how does it actually work? And we drill right down, we peer, peel away all those assumptions and see what actually happens in real life. Um, and and very often we find that um, you know the crims are very very happy indeed. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's very very simple to launder vast sums of money um, to your heart's content. And one extra level, it's not even a matter of tick boxes because the boxes that we're asked to tick themselves don't actually um, focus on whether there's an impact on crime or terrorism or uh, or even money laundering. So the system that's, that's set up to be anti-money laundering doesn't actually have any metrics to identify if it has an impact on money laundering, <laughs> let alone crime or terrorism. I, I think that's the smoking gun, you know, because yeah. it, it clearly, you know, and it's unfortunate because I think we've been conditioned in a way into thinking these systems are necessary. And, you know, it, it was just until this year and it was only because I'm into Bitcoin and because these regulations are starting to have an effect on our industry. Uh, we, we know that Janet Yellen, you know, the, the U.S. secretary, mm. you know, you, you hear the rhetoric, you hear the rhetoric from Jerome Powell. You know, Bitcoin is 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 only used for illicit purposes. It's is used to skip, you know, uh, anti money laundering regulation. But when you actually look at the data and chain analysis actually came out with some figures, it was a small percentage of the total Bitcoin transactions are connected to illicit activities and a much higher percentage is actually connected to fiat. But they don't say that, right? It's like they they, they want you to believe a certain narrative. But once you, you know, peel back the onion, so to speak, it, 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 it you know, I, I can only, and again, I, I know Dr. Paul, you don't like to speculate. You, you like to be data and evidence based. But at the same time, you come to the conclusion they're really doing this for control. I, I, if it's not for stopping crime, if right. if more companies are, you know, are, are if, if if companies are spending more on the compliance costs than they actually are on getting back money from crime, what is this but not control? And again, of course, that's speculation. But from the eyes of a Bitcoiner, that's what we see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and that's certainly you know, that. that that um, uh, may well actually be a driver of some people. So, for example, the U.S. government is a good example. The U.S. Treasury, um, uh, you mentioned right at the outset, um, is focused on sanctions, etc. Now, it, it has been said by some, and it's very, very difficult to prove because you've got to be in the meetings. And I, I do have some anecdotal evidence, but it's only anecdotal, so I don't put it any higher than that. But, but there are certainly um, uh, some some say that because the U.S. has such a disproportionate control over FATF, so FATF has only got 38 members, uh, and it, it those members um, essentially rule um, 205 countries and jurisdictions around the world, you must follow these rules. But in fact, in reality, it's not those 38 members. So smaller countries like New Zealand and Australia who are FATF members don't have the power of the U.S. and the U.K. and a few others. There's only a few countries that really drive inside um, FATF and there's some researchers that have really focused in on that and how FATF operates and so the US has got its normal sanctions approach because it's the US dollar is, is the um, reserve currency but also if a, a, a number of researchers are suggesting and then they're not they're getting quite close to demonstrating it but it's it's hard to prove that the US might not really care where the money laundering um, laws work at all because it's another form of sanction. And it's a form of sanction that appears to be objective and appears to be done by this other um, uh, agency, although the US is, is heavily controlling it. Now, there's layers of that too. So for example, the FBI and a few other agencies would disagree with that because they are genuinely focused on trying to stop crime. 
but then you look at and, and you look in treasury and you split parts of treasury up there'll be some of those in there who are really really focused on crime as well but there are others who think yeah well, this is really quite a nice measure we're able to get another sanction out there so uh so it's it's nuanced and again again my research isn't isn't particularly concerned about what the what the rationale is because I haven't been able to get into that to identify the rationale that involves interviewing all those people and testing um, uh, that which which I have not done but the certainly the um, the the figures real you know it is so profoundly ineffective uh, that you do have to ask the question, what is the rationale? And the rationale could be, as you say, control. We don't care if it works or not. We just want control. Or the rationale could be there is a deep narrative that people believe it. Therefore, they're not going to ask that question. No, it is true because I believe it's true. Therefore, it's true. Um, and so they believe they're having the impact on crime and they're not going to have that other conversation. So it could span any of those any of those elements. So again, I don't want to attribute one to the other, but it's certainly consistent with what you say as well. It sounds like it was born out of good intentions, and then there was a bureaucracy built around it. A lot of people's jobs depend on this narrative, and then you know, hey, hey, why not? You know, we have all this information. You know, the government's not going to say no to it. So I think, and then over time, it's just solidified, and now it's just become an expectation. It's if you can't have these things, the world's going to burn down. I think that's where we find our situation in today, but. Absolutely phenomenal conversation, extremely interesting. But anyways, Phil, it's time for there's a there's a software release today. Why don't you tell everybody about it? Software releases. Software releases is brought to you by CypherSafe. Check them out. CypherSafe.io. Get your hands on a cipher wheel. This is the best way to store your Bitcoin seed. Fireproof, waterproof, pet proof. The link is down below. All right, we've got Seed Signer version 0.4.5 that was released. It is down below in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. All right, guys, that was our show. Before we go, I want to give a very, very special shout out. We are deeply humbled to have Dr. Ron Paul on the show. He was quoted in The Economist, Forbes, Political Reuters, and he has done a testimony in the U.S. Senate describing the modern anti-money laundering experiment and really, really cool stuff. Definitely support Dr. Ron. We're going to put his Bitcoin address down below. He's doing the research, and I'm sure we're going to use a lot of this research as Bitcoin and these antiquated, ineffective regulations inevitably clash within the next five years. I'm sure Dr. Ron, uh, Dr. Ron Paul is going to be we're going to use his work and perhaps we're going to use his des uh, testimony. So definitely, definitely support uh, Dr. Ron. Use the Bitcoin address down below. Donate a little bit, guys. We have to give back um, for the much smarter, educated people that have all the fancy degrees. Because Phil and I are just, you <laughs> are just, are just Bitcoiners, YouTube Bitcoiners. But anyways, guys, if you enjoyed the show, you know what to do. Smash that like button. And of course, if you want to continue hearing the Bitcoin news from the plea pleb perspective and the catastrophic fails, definitely consider subscribing to Simply Bitcoin. And we'll see you tomorrow, guys, for a brand new episode. Maybe KYC AML's use case was to validate crime all along. Yeah.